that was, that was terrible. Wow. Did you recognize what it was? Yeah? Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Almost. Do you see what we've done? We've misaligned in time the individual instruments. They did not play together. You've heard them. But you, what you heard was not really what you wanted to hear. The timing was off. The individual instruments were not aligned in time. They were not synchronized. They did not share the same clock or the same time. Now, I apologize that you had to listen to that, but there's a point to it. Now, typically, fortunately, it does not sound like that. And there's an obvious reason. And the reason is the conductor, right? The conductor provides that time reference. The conductor provides a clock, such that musicians know when and how to play, such that overall music emerges and not what you've just heard. So let's listen to it again, this time with conductor. Now, there you go. You had to wait for it, but it was worth it. That is music. That is synchronization. That is the individual musicians within the orchestra playing together, being on the same clock. And we can visualize this in a much simpler way. What you see here is blue and yellow, two rhythms, two parts of the music, and they're nicely aligned in time as illustrated by the yellow lines. That is synchronization. Different elements, in this case, the musicians coming together, being on the same clock. All right, so I don't study Beethoven. My name is Dr. Flavio Frolic. I'm an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I run a research lab, and we study the brain. Now, the principle of synchronization that I've just demonstrated to you with Beethoven's Fifth, that, we believe, is a fundamental mechanism of how the brain works. That ability for different parts to come together in time to synchronize is not only how your brain works, it also what we need to consider to understand the biological basis of disorders of the central nervous system, such as psychiatric illness. It encompasses depression, schizophrenia, autism spectrum disorders, and many other illnesses. We need to understand that synchronization to understand how the brain works and how, in a novel and safe way, we can treat these disorders. And that's what I would like to explain to you. Now, let's have a look at brain activity. Let's actually listen to it. It doesn't sound like Beethoven's Fifth, uh, but when I show it to you, you see that rhythmic structure. What you're looking at here is the recording of electric activity in a human brain, and you see it has this temporal structure. It has that rhythm. That is a brain rhythm. Now, how does such rhythm emerge in your brain? Let me explain. What you need to know is that individual pieces within the brain, individual brain cells, small networks within the brain, they all have their own rhythm, meaning they like to exhibit this type of rhythmically patterned electric activity. And that's what you see here in blue. Now, the way I've drawn them here is that they're all lined up in time. They're all synchronized. And what we get when we look at the emerging overall signal, if you will, the sum of all these blue pieces of activity, you get the orange. You get a nicely structured rhythm. That is how these brain rhythms emerge. They emerge through the synchronization, through the shared timing of all the individual bits and pieces of electric activity in the brain. 
And the synchronization is fundamental for your brain to be able to generate such rhythms. And I can show that to you. If we shift those individual pieces of activity shown in blue in time relative to each other, and we again look at the overall emerging picture, the sum of all of it, what we see here in orange, is what we get, namely nothing. So you understand how important it is for the different piece of the brain to be on the same clock, to share time, like the musicians when they play Beethoven's Fifth. They need to be synchronized for an overall meaningful activity pattern to emerge. Now, the brain does not have a conductor. And what I mean with that, there is no signal, no timing signal that helps all these different pieces of the brain to follow and be on the same time. It works fundamentally different from your orchestra. And what you need to know is that when we look at the brain in terms of its structures, one of its main features are the gazillion of connections between individual brain cells, the nerve fibers. All these brain cells, they talk with each other, they talk with a lot, a lot of other brain cells, and at the same time, they're also receiving input, or if you will, listen to a lot of other cells. So now what you have is not a central signal providing the clock like the conductor in your orchestra, but rather you have this self-organized behavior of all the different pieces, networks, and individual cells in the brain talking and listening, adjusting their own activity based on the input they're receiving, and together they manage to synchronize and generate those rhythms. Amazing. Now, I want to illustrate that, and what I brought is not two brain cells, but two metronomes. Those are old-fashioned mechanical metronomes. They go tick-tock, tick-tock. They have their own rhythm. Uh, they're set both to go at the same frequency. So you can think of them as two brain cells having their own rhythm. And now we're going to have them talk to each other. So how can two metronomes talk to each other? Well, I've put them on a board that can very easily move. So as the metronome goes tick-tock, that mechanical motion translates that board on which the metronome sit. So that is the metronome or the brain cell talking. Now, what is the listening in that process of self-emergent synchronization? The listening is that as the metronome is moving, uh, it stands on this moving platform, and that movement actually affects how the metronome goes tick-tock. Let's look at it. So you have the two metronomes synchronized. You see how the platform is moving? That is them, in a self-organized way, talk with each other and figure out how to be on the same clock. Now, I took them off. They're not talking with each other anymore. You see what happens? The communication link is broken. Think of two brain areas or two brain cells. They can't properly listen and talk to each other. They cannot synchronize and they cannot generate those all important electric rhythms, those brain rhythms. Now, the reason why we're so interested in synchronization is because there's a lot of evidence that an impairment of the brain in terms of its ability to synchronize and generate this rhythm, is very tightly linked with mental illness. There's quite convincing evidence that the inability to sufficiently synchronize electric activity in different parts of the brain is impaired in disorders such as depression, schizophrenia, autism, ADHD, perhaps Alzheimer's, and many others. So, by understanding synchronization, we actually believe we start to understand the biological mechanism of psychiatric illness. And we don't stop there. Understanding the biological cause of mental illness is obviously incredibly important. But how about if we use that mechanism as a treatment target? So typically when we say target, what we mean is a specific receptor, a specific molecule, where we could design a new drug that matches that receptor. That's not what I mean here. 
What I'm talking about is using those electric activity patterns as a target and designing new interventions that helps to restore and enhance that synchronization. And one way how we can do that is with non-invasive brain stimulation. Specifically, we call it transcranial alternating current stimulation, or TACS. Let me explain. What you see here is that we're attaching electrodes to the scalp, and this is not electroconvulsive therapy. We're using an incredibly weak current, an electric current that you can barely feel, and we pattern that electric current into a meaningful waveform to target, the in a frequency-specific way, the synchronization that we want to restore or enhance. So we are not overriding brain activity. Rather, we're just adding back in that conductor to help restore and enhance that synchronization. So what you want to know now is whether such a treatment really treats those patients. And we have several clinical trials ongoing, and I don't yet have the answer for you. But I want to show you why we're very hopeful. One example where brain synchronization has been shown to be crucial is creativity. Creativity is the ability to generate something new and meaningful based on your previous experiences and your existing knowledge. So it should not come as a surprise that synchronization that enables different parts of the brain that store different aspects of your knowledge and your previous experience is absolutely crucial such that you can combine all this into a new important way. So the question we ask, if we use this novel form of non-invasive brain stimulation and enhance synchronization, can we actually alter creativity? The question you have now is, is there really a way to measure creativity in a scientific way? And the answer is actually yes. There's a test, which is like an IQ test, but instead of measuring intelligence, it measures creativity. Let me briefly show you. Here's a test question. You have a little bit of time. Please come up with a drawing, including that black line, and the drawing should be creative, new, meaningful, and also add a great title. A few seconds. Here is what I've probably done. And uh, you don't uh, need to stand up here to understand that this is not very creative. <laughs> now, let me show you the response of one of the participants in our study who received that brain stimulation. Same question, very different answer. Now, there are a lot of scientific ways how to exactly uh, assay creativity based on these responses, but I think the principle is clear. So what we've done is we've borrowed a study design essentially from clinical trials, and we performed a study where we evaluated whether this novel form of brain stimulation, TACS, really can alter creativity in comparison to a placebo or sham stimulation. And what we found is that, yes, indeed, we managed to significantly and substantially enhance creativity by targeting synchronization. Now, that is a study in healthy controls, and it's important to emphasize there's still a lot of work we need to do until we can establish such new interventions as treatment for serious mental illness. But the reason why we're hopeful is because the type of brain rhythm and synchronization we targeted here is exactly the same that we know is impaired in patients, for example, with depression. So here is where we're going with this. We understand that synchronization of brain activity is absolutely vital, not only for normal brain function, but also in terms of us understanding it as a fundamental mechanism that is impaired in psychiatric illness. So synchronization of brain activity, these brain rhythms that emerge from that synchronization, for us, we think of them as a treatment target. And we hope and we're currently evaluating that through targeting synchronization and restoring synchronization with non-invasive brain stimulation, we can provide relief to those so many patients with mental illness that suffer today because we don't yet have an adequate treatment arsenal.
Thank you very much.